And I'm back on. Yes, I am. I can hear that weird sound you get. Um, first of all, name. Let me just, here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to talk about the recent past, not going too far deep, except the first couple of slides go a little deep um, in terms of the deep past, not deep technically. Um, and then we'll talk a little about sort of what we think the near future is and actually how the team's operating and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of it actually is kind of just the process of how we do things too, by the way. So observation one. Observation two, I got no problem with question and answer. Just, I don't care. Ask questions. If for some reason I'm not ready to answer it yet, um, I'll do one of two things. I will say, I can't answer that without killing you. Or two, um, just wait till the end and we'll talk about it a little later. Is that good? Sure. Yes, you have a question already. Yes. My name is if, Kenneth. If, if I ask a question <laughs> and you kill me, will you answer the question to the others afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> that is the true spirit of PowerShell community. You see, sacrifice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, no, that's great. All right, so um, who am I? My name is Kenneth Hansen. Um, I know actually a lot of people turned out not to know when I came. That's fine. Uh, let's see, I've been on PowerShell about 14 years. On Hill Calvo and I actually run the PowerShell engineering team. Um, so we're the guys who have to get stuff done. So if it doesn't work, it is our fault. <laughs> if it does work, somebody else did something good. Um, <laughs> That's kind of been my job since PowerShell v2 when I, I took that job over. In v1, uh, I was an individual contributor. I've been up and down individual contributor manager most of my career. And um, if you like the way you do command lists with your APIs, that's kind of my stuff. Providers are also my stuff. Metadata is my stuff. Extended type system, a lot of stuff. So we've been around there, and then the modules we sort of worked with, got one of my guys, Dan Harmon, to do. So that's kind of the deep past. Um, they keep me away from code now, so that's, <laughs> you don't want to see me try it anymore. Um, anyway, that's it. Oh, and on Hell, Calvo, as I say, is the other guy that actually he runs the uh, developer side of it. I run the program manager side of it. All right, so um, we're just going to go through, yeah, this. Done. Next. Um, we'll try to spend about uh, 15, I don't know, 20 minutes to pass. But this is worth pointing out. And I point this out, so I am going a little deep deep pass for a second. Uh, back to Monad. Everybody remember Monad, right? Thank you very much. Perhaps some of you recognize the syntax, right? It were actually the backslashes didn't have that. You know, there's a whole discussion for a long time on what backslash, forward slash, slash, slash. It was kind of a funny time. And if you want to, actually, we do have the BNF, uh, the Bacchus Now Forum. Mason, Jim Chur's got that. Maybe we'll stick it up somewhere on some site. And I actually have it here if you want on a USB stick just for fun. Um, and then you can actually run the original uh, uh, um, PowerShell MSH once in a while if you want to. If you read the manifesto, I'm going to read it just because I can't help it. Deliver an extensible scripting environment. We know what that is. That is secure, interactive, programmable, and production ready to enable consistent and reliable automation of administrative tasks. We are almost going to get there someday. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, honest to God, we are. We know we're not there yet. There's still a lot to do. PowerShell has, is, is well aware of that. So don't be confused. We are not confused. Um, and so it's coming. Uh, one thing really worth noting, and I can't stress this enough, it is community-driven so much of what we do. The list of names on the board, there's 80 names, Remember, we published the RTM, of, or RTW they call it at the time, of PowerShell, November 14, 2006. In 2004, we already had community members, 80 of them posting bugs. These guys are actually, are you there? Woo, give them a hand. Thank you very much. Right there. You see, I got it right, didn't I? I got it right. No, so this is just, this is actually amazing. And this, just for fun, the background here that you see is from the very first PowerShell summit in EU, which was actually in Frankfurt about five years ago. So that's kind of a, just a note. So it's been very community driven. We really appreciate it. We're not going to stop doing that. We're going to grow that. You'll see that over time. All right, past year. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much in detail. If you have questions about it, feel free to ask. 
If you have issues with it, feel free to comment. That's okay too. But I do want to sort of blow past it a little bit so some people have a sense of what sort of happened over the past year. Um, first, we have released a bunch of Windows Server stuff. TP3, TP4, TP5 is on its way. Right? Everybody sort of got that in focus, and hopefully you got you know, access to those builds. Um, the next one, I can't resist a chart, WMF5. <laughs> now, there's good and bad with WMF5. The bad was the recall. We'll talk about that for a couple of minutes, and you can ask any question you want, and I will honestly disavow knowledge. No, I will <laughs> explain you know, a, a little bit of what happened and why. Um, but nonetheless, we had a bunch of previews, which was a, a new thing for us. Um, and then we actually uh, put the thing out. We had to recall it due to a uh, installation bug, actually. And I was the one who made that call about two days before I headed to Christmas vacation. So that was a, a fun time for me. Um, the fact that we had the bug in the first place was bad. Be clear about that. Um, I think we handled the recall OK. We got the news out. and got it off the shelves fast. And the reason we did that, just to see people clear, is that it happened at installation, right? We corrupted the PS module path, if people remember, at installation time. So although if you knew we were going to corrupt it, you could work around it by saving and restoring it. If you didn't know it, you got blown away. So in the end, we just said, we got to yank this. We can't, we can't do that. Um, so it turned out to be just a, a, a nit error, but it required us to, to fix it. And I, couldn't Q, I couldn't fix it. I couldn't QFE it, right? So that's why we did the recall. Um, I still think it's the right call, particularly given the volume. Within five weeks of a re-release, we had over 130,000 downloads, and we by now have over 200,000 downloads of WMF5. That is a phenomenal download number. I think it beats everybody else's that we've ever had. And there's this back pressure that actually was existing on WMF5 as people released it because, this is kind of my, my view, uh, because what I'm seeing, you guys may be seeing something different, but people waited to put DSC into production deployment for WMF5.0 to actually release. But we've had such a quick uptake of desired state configuration, a much faster ramp of desired state configuration than we ever did for PowerShell 1.0 itself. The rate of adoption has just been, it's another hockey stick, right? And this is, in fact, part of what drove the WMF 5.0 uh, adoption rate, which has been so incredibly fast of just even the download numbers. So we see this continuing. If you take a look at week six, as I say, it's about 200,000. Week six, week seven, it's just the numbers are great. And they're continuing to grow at a, at a, at a great rate. Um, the challenge we had, and we don't mention it here, I guess, I'll, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk past, present, future all at the same time, unless it confuses you, and then just tell me to you know, do something different. Um, the re-release was where I think was really painful for people, right? Because we yanked the dang thing in November, I mean, December, right, before Christmas, and said, sorry, we'll get to you in a little bit as soon as we can. We tried to be purposely vague, because we didn't quite know. Um, we knew it was not a big problem to fix. Well, it turned out it took us a week or two to yeah, get ready to get back and get it fixed, get tested. And then once we, once we do, because it's an installation problem, we have this huge matrix for WMF, right, of testing, of all the different things you have to test across and all the different possible things that go wrong. And uh, so that takes a couple weeks itself. The other part of the challenge we get into is that we work in the Windows org, right? And, once, and that's, a, that's a big beast. And it, we have like billions of dollars on the line. And so if we don't slot ourselves in that release train at the right time, right, then the build guys are going, I'm sorry, but I can't help you because I got to get this other stuff done. Now, and, and, and while we, the PowerShell team, love being agile and responsive, and Microsoft is still learning how to do that. Right, now when Satya came in, he has, how do I say this right? He's done a phenomenal job of changing the culture. Stuff I've done in the past two or three years, like shipping this thing called Pester in Windows, right? It's an open source created thing, and we shipped it in Windows. I would have gotten fired, like, right, three years ago, and escorted. Not just fired, I would have been escorted out the building, and, right? I've just been in all kinds of trouble, and now we're allowed to do that. And that's really because of Satya. He's done a great job of changing the culture and the mentality and the approach. But that doesn't mean that all of our tooling hasn't necessarily changed the next day, right? So the tooling that we operate with on a daily basis is still not quite there. That's partly why I love GitHub <laughs> open source, right? I've got the right set of tools. So, so 
just be aware that that's part of the issue as we, as we try to re-release things and, and, and things happen. We apologize. And then part of the communication challenge says, hey, yeah, but just tell me. And the answer is we don't always know. Right, right, I've kept you up to date every week. Okay, anybody have questions about that whole process? I don't want to deal into too much detail, but I know there were some questions and I wanted to at least get out there so people are aware of what happens. Okay, that's demo 5 but the RTM is absolutely freaking awesome. All right, and just to be clear, that's what we put in 5.0. <laughs> that's the list, so there's a lot of stuff. Somebody should do a session on that, you know, all the detail 5.0 and spend like a couple hours and and have a ball, but there's a lot there to play with, and if those of you who are trainers and everything, you know, play with it, it's awesome. Okay, um, and some of it's, you know, some of it's big, you know, it just sits there, classes, okay, that's a small item, you know, resources, <laughs> right? It's like, they're kind of big, but they're, uh, but they're important. The gallery, the second thing that we're actually doing huge on is the gallery, right? We have had over 1.6 million downloads, and we started the gallery under a year ago, under, you got to reflect on that for just a moment. And when we first started, we had 77 resources, 23 modules, mostly developed by ourselves and a few other close friends and family, right? We're way over 500 now. I think we're up to 600 and something. If I looked, we got like almost 100 in the past month. So again, even the rate of support that you guys have given us is going up. That's going to continue. Just to be clear, the gallery, we're going to keep throwing more and more stuff there. Most, almost all will be PowerShell. We might even get other management artifacts going there. And in fact, we work with other groups at Microsoft. They're going, oh, you have this gallery thing. Maybe we need one too. So you guys are helping us kind of get the whole Microsoft uh, ecosystem bootstrapped, if you will, in that, in that space. Uh, we've been very surprised, actually. Now, it is worth pointing out, here's some caveats. Um, of the 1.6 million, you know, like I swear 400,000 of those are like, an Azure module, right? And then when it loads the Azure module, reload stuff. Some of you might be aware of what I'm talking about. A, they're fixing it over time, but B, that still leads with over like a million downloads. It's just a phenomenal rate, so it's been great. Uh, gallery, so, and we'll keep pushing that. If you have suggestions, keep putting them out in user voice. Uh, open source, put a bunch of stuff out on open source. Open SSH is more or less there. We still got to uh, release it. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, script analyzer, editor services, PS read line, blah, 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 blah. Worth point. <laughs> it's just going to keep growing, right? We are motivated to put everything we can on open source as fast as I can. Just people want directions. This is all I'm, I, the intent of this talk is not so much to go into specific detail on each feature, although I don't mind doing some of that. It's more just to give you a sense as to where we're flowing. Hopefully you can get the sense of where I'm flowing already, but to be clear, we are going as fast as we can with as much as I can to open source period, within the constraints, almost, I'll get right here, within the constraints of business reasoning, what can I justify from a business standpoint, or, or what am I constrained to do from a business standpoint, and resources that I have available, and then third, I would say our experience with it, you know, we, we're getting some experience here, but we're still not necessarily smooth at this yet, right? We still got to smooth out a few of the processes. We still got to work a little more on some of the governance stuff, some of the RFD stuff. We started the process, we're, we're, we're working through it with intent, but we're not there yet. So, but I would expect that over the next while, you will see a hell of a lot more there, and, and hopefully you'll love it. We're going to love it. Yes, sir. Is there any other team uh, within Microsoft which is adopting open source so fast as the publisher team? Well, I can't speak to other teams' failures. <laughs> 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 Now, the question was, is there any other uh, teams within Microsoft that are moving open source as fast as PowerShell? Um, and I'm sure that the, that the answer is yes, there's somebody. I don't necessarily know them. Um, we seem to be moving about as quick as anybody. Now, some are you know, going to Linux and other things. Right now, we have, you see down here, DSC on Linux, another sort of new uh, thing for us. How do we put desired state configuration on Linux, right? And SQL came out now, for example, on Linux. And so I think that's a great, uh, that's a great thing. But in terms of uh, actually open source, I'm not as familiar with, there's the whole open source teams, you know, the whole, and, and, and I will say actually we're contributing, the Hyper-V team and others actually contribute a fair bit, actually contributing back to uh, open source uh, very substantially, um, which is a, a, certainly a new thing and it's something that's been very valuable. So I think the idea of open source has a lot of support. Developer 
Um, and the developer division would be the right one. That's right. Correct. Yeah, they've actually got it in spades right now. Yeah, they're, they're doing great. The whole core CLR thing is awesome. Very, very awesome. In fact, we live on core CLR, so we're very, very happy with core CLR. They're probably moving faster than us. The f team moving faster than us is the developer division. Thank you. <laughs> I knew there was a, a politically correct answer to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> the other... Oh, we are being recorded here, aren't we? Oh, the, um, <laughs> that's okay. We're, we're still just doing a, a, a Q&A. That's why I love PowerShell summits, by the way. Um, you know, we, these things we started, oh, a, um, in fact, let me, I'm going to speak to a few seconds to PowerShell summits. I don't mean to bore people, but give you a little bit of the history and you get a sense as to why, why we're here and what we, what we do out of them, why we really want them and support them. Um, oh, it was in Berlin. See, Germany, see, it's a place for innovation, you know? I was in, or frustration, because I was in Berlin getting really frustrated, one of the tech heads, and, and we finished another uh, beginner session of PowerShell with like a thousand users, and then we had this advanced session, where it was just a Q&A session, and we had like a small room, a little bigger than this, but they maxed out at over 100 people, and then they had fire code problems, and so they had to shut people away, and it was just, it was Jeffrey, I, Bruce, Lee, somebody else. We had like two or three, uh, Jim Chur I thought was there. Anyway, we had a few people there just to answer questions, just Q&A for an hour, hour and a half. Um, and um, we had turned people away. And so they reset us for another session, like at 8.30 in the morning, the last day of the conference. And nobody knew about it, but we still ended up having to turn people away from that one. So well over 100 people again standing in a room and then they were illegal, so they had to leave. And, I, and I, it felt bad. They're just like, oh, this, just, this is terrible. We can't keep doing this. Um, so we actually, at that time, uh, Jeffrey and I said, how can we talk to people and how can we get people to talk to each other that are really passionate and are already deeply involved in PowerShell? Right? We got all these new users coming in because we're hitting the early majority. And I actually think, by the way, PowerShell is just on the beginning part of that ramp. If you look at the market numbers, and I can't I could draw over there, I guess, but you know, perhaps another day, you'll actually see that we expect that there'll be many, 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 many more PowerShell users than there are today in the next years. It's just going to happen. Um, and, and so how do we handle all those new people coming in? They're going to consume all our time if we don't actually make time for people like yourselves, for the experts. Does that make sense? And so that's actually when we first said we should have a PowerShell summit. <laughs> and we created the first one in Red Rock. Um, that, that same spring, actually. We decided that in November and had it in spring. Had 50 people there and about 10 team members and kicked it off. And then the next year, that's when we did the one that I showed the picture of in Frankfurt and Tobias and others were there. And he says, hey, we're going to do this whole German thing. I said, go for it. It sounds great. And over time, I think actually this year, we've just, just it's like come of age, right? It's just been a fantastic conference. A large number of people, we've been glad to be able to send a few more members and hopefully next year we'll even send more and, and we'll just grow it. That said, and part of the reason we do that is so that not only can we get together and talk, but also you guys can amplify whatever message, right? Because we know we can't scale to the rest of the community. But you guys can. You guys help each other, and that's what's key. Um, that said, it's worth noting that now we've got North America going. We've got Europe going. So, of course, we're going to start somewhere else. So we're going to start a little more seriously about the PowerShell Asia Summit, which is in October. And it turns out it's actually a pretty quick flight from here. So if you guys want to go back again, we've already got Jeffrey's kind of committed. Bruce is actually pretty committed, and I'm fairly committed. So we'll have a few team members. We'll get a pretty good group. Um, Ravi and Ben and a few others are actually doing that. I don't know if they're here or not, but sort of keep track of that. Um, the PowerShell uh, 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 Summit in Asia will actually kick off again in October. So if, you get, uh, if you're you know, missing that, that drug, we'll give it to you. <laughs> um, the, um, if you need your fix again, that's a better way to say it, isn't it? You see, I need a politically correct person here for me. Um, a note on these, uh, talking about community. Uh, these are actually contributors that we uh, gave some Azure uh, 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 dollars to. It was supposed to be a significant amount. It's, we've had a clerical error, so we're going to go fix it. I won't tell you what it was. <laughs> I won't tell you the amount because I want to make sure it actually lands. But Ian, Alexander, Keith, Clint, and Daniel, Reedy, and various other people have done a, just a fantastic job about contributing specifically to the open source stuff, be they uh, modules or not. And I didn't want, to, didn't want to miss that. OK, a couple more points, uh, lectures we'll keep going through here. Past year, this is one other thing I just want to hit on in terms of moving to the future. This is the PowerShell homepage. 
Microsoft.com slash PowerShell. Have you guys ever been there? Exactly. That's kind of what I expected. <laughs> Over time, you might want to go there more or drive more or help us do it more. What we found is that people started to begin with PowerShell. We needed a place to point them over time, just start them curated, get a little hands-on demo, that kind of thing. Over time, that's where it's going to land. As we start to work through, as we start to organize a little bit our community effort, um, and I'll speak about this a little more, but I'll, I'll start it now. Most of the announcements will go here first, and then we'll blog with a pointer to it. The blog should become a little more casual. Right now, it's a little formal, right? And then we'll use uh, user voice and GitHub for um, uh, for other things. So PowerShell Summit's uh, homepage. Yep, that's it. So homepage, and if you want other things, you can download WMF, you can hit to the gallery, you can get all that stuff from there. And the usage has gone up, but not as much. All right, so past year, I'm about done talking about the past. Um, I just wanted to go through it as we have. Uh, let's see, homepage security. Yeah, that's gonna, it's been a pretty big issue. As people have known in this conference, we've worked on that. The Azure Extension Handler, people are sort of familiar with that. That's actually a way in, time, in Azure, I see some funny faces. Azure, you can actually start loading a DSC configuration automatically, bootstrap from scratch into your, uh, your Azure um, uh, VMs and machines. So that, that's an interesting thing you can actually take advantage of a little more. Um, uh, this is um, OMS, people familiar with OMS, Azure Automation, right? That we've finally got uh, PowerShell strong support and now DSC going in, so it's becoming a little more of a server. We have DSC Linux and we begin to talk to Chef, Puppet, Ansible, and others. So that's just uh, the list for the year. Make sense? Uh, what did we learn? We're going to blow past this one pretty quick. Um, I already sort of hit on the first one. Uh, being agile and shipping to Windows at the same time is water and oil but we're stirring it up and making it mix anyway, and we're, we're trying to find ways to get that, get that working. So that's gonna keep going. Um, the, we are evolving the engineering culture, and you are gonna see this change over time, right? People are aware that we integrated dev and test together, became a single discipline, used to be separate disciplines, now they're one. Um, and sometimes there's some fits and starts <laughs> in the code you'll see as the developers aren't quite used to knowing how to test their code, and some of the testers aren't quite used to how to develop the code. And so we're going through some of that, some of that challenge. That was part of the WMF5 issue. And we will continue to evolve the um, community communications. One thing worth noting here, I pointed out here, direct customer engagements. Over the past year, we have probably had more direct customer engagements than before, meaning hundreds of different customers we've actually met with and spent a lot of time with in the product team. So we actually have tons of, we have lots of input vehicles right now. I've got user voice, which is the first primary input vehicle, and you guys, everybody should be using it. I think you've heard it like a billion times this week. If you haven't, we did a bad job. <laughs> and I'll go remind people, right? Absolutely user voice, put stuff on user voice. If the, if the thing you want to get fixed is already on open source, is already on GitHub, then you can raise an issue in GitHub instead. Otherwise, user voice, user voice, user voice. Got it? Um, uh, yeah, so the other piece we do, though, is if there's a specifically interesting set of customers that have a set of interesting architectures, a dilemma or problem, or want to be fairly advanced users of PowerShell technology, hook us up with them, tell us about them, and we might actually just engage direct with them and actually work through it, right? So we use, we use the community at large as proxies. We use all these other things. I can't scale to the in, you know, 1.6 million downloads and <laughs> however many downloads we'll have of WMF. But we can pull a few more people into the fold, if you will, have a little deeper engagement. That's also very useful for us. Um, and, and you should make sure you do that. As I speak to this issue of user voice, um, yeah, fine, we'll talk to this too. If I speak to the issue of uh, user voice and all these channels, we'll talk about them. Um, three things, do me a favor. This is how to get us to do things. Right? which is kind of useful, I think, for you to know. Um, one, you can always file the issue itself. Do that. Don't, don't not do that. It is best if you can tell us why you care because we have to decide to do something about it. So tell us the impact it's having on you of having or not having that feature or that bug is having. You got me? Don't just tell me what the problem is. Tell me why I care. I do care because it's a problem. To be, I'm a bit anal that way. I'm, 
a bit overly, overly you know, perfectionist. But it helps us a lot actually to work through the process if we just know, okay, that's why they need it. Here's the impact. And it also provides this other benefit if you give sort of the scenario in which it happens. Because otherwise what can happen is somebody can take the issue, they'll think they fixed it because they've fixed the isolated case, right? The engineer is down there, you know, maybe they're a new engineer or something, right? They just graduated. They got this little bug. They believe you. They get assigned it. They go in. They get the dang thing fixed. And then they're not quite sure what the context was. So they don't necessarily fix the whole scenario for you. Does it make sense to you? So you, you can just picture this happening, right? <laughs> right? So, so the guys haven't lived your life. Some of us have lived your life. <laughs> Some of us have the greatest heritage to prove we lived your life. Others haven't. <laughs> Right? And so you want to help everybody out. So just, just give them context, impact, and then the issue itself as best you can. That's my request. Hearing heads nod, and that helps us a lot. All right, so um, we're going to continue to have a rich engagement. We just uh, added the Twitter channel. Twitter is not so much about filing bugs, right? It's just about giving information in and out. Give us a pointer. Bugs are all going user voice, please. Um, workarounds, you know, user voice, <laughs> right? Um, if you want to point to somebody, use your voice from Twitter, that's all great, but that's kind of more of that channel. Homepage we talked about, that's more for broadcast information. Over time on the homepage, we will probably add, this is something we'll um, start talking through a little bit. In this next year, I'm, I wanted to get it done last year, but we just started the homepage, the gallery, and a bunch of other initiatives last year, so we're, we're, we're crawling. We're not quite running yet. Um, over next year, it would be great, I think, and you can give me feedback on this now or later, to have what we'll call hero stories, which is, hey, the system was taking me 30 hours before to do this deployment. I implemented PowerShell DSC. It's now 10 minutes. Here's what I did. Does that make sense? And I think it's really valuable, not just for us. It gives us context. We love it. We all feel good, go home, sleep well. Hey, I did something. But you guys, right, it gives you guys context. It also gives you a little more ammo as you go and explain, hey, boss, here's why we need to redo this ancient system that's in Perl, in PowerShell, or in DSC. Because maybe in your life, you're able to convince your organizations with pure intelligence and light in my world, we sometimes have to use other people's examples and bad experience, right? And so, so it gives you kind of that lever that I think is kind of useful. So we're hopefully have a place off the homepage just for kind of, you know, my story, so to speak, where you talk about here's what happened, here's what I did. Um, as we do that, an issue that comes up is, okay, that's great, but I work for the NSA, and I can't tell you that I work for the NSA, and so how will I, <laughs> you know... Should I lie about who I am? You know, make up a fictitious name with a passport? Or you know, what exactly do you want me to do here? And the answer is just, um, we'll have a way, in theory, we'll have a way where you just send us your information with your story and we'll curate it. A, we'll try to make sure you actually exist. <laughs> B, um, um, and you'll tell us if you don't want a, your name published or not. Just tell us how you want to be known. Does that make sense? And then we'll, we'll do it as that. Well, the theory in my mind came out this last night talking to somebody who had this issue. It was like, oh, okay, what I should do is actually before we actually publish it, we'll send it back to you. Here's what it's going to look like. You know, you can redact anything you want. You can prove it or not. That way you've got the opportunity to actually get it out. People have a tendency to go to a trusted place for it, but you can still get the stories out. So that's kind of thinking. If you have feedback, open issues, ideas, feel free to uh, shoot us email, that kind of thing. So that's kind of the homepage. Um, the community, let's see, uh, yeah, we're on Hacker News, all that stuff. The issues get raised on the user voice, I've said that before. Discussions of the issues more and more will happen in RFC and on GitHub. So we're going to start opening that process up just a lot more. Over the next year, just look for that. Does that make sense? Uh, we're starting to do some of that now. Everybody been participating in some of that, right? You should see it. It's going to start growing over time. Most everything, and by the end of the year, I would love to see if most of our design discussions are actually happening in that form, even internally, and you're able to participate. That's the intent. Check me next year, see if we get there. But in theory, that's what we're, can of you're not there. Okay, I know. We'll do it. I'll get a grade next year. Um, we'll go through all these things and ask. Um, Hacker News, Bridget, uh, let's see, other things I wanted to go through. 
Um, I think that's kind of it at this, uh, this point. All right. Oh, there's one other thing. All right, before I talk about forward-looking predictions, I'll just tantalize you. <laughs> How many minutes do I have? Oh, yeah, we're fine. Um, the um, other thing worth noting is we will probably, um, and so you think about the questions you're going to want. In May sometime, I'll probably do just a 20 or 30 minute sort of webcast thingy where you sort of say, okay, last month, next month, and then we'll drill into specific topic areas more directionally, kind of like we've done here, but a little different. Um, the first one might be about, you know, open, might be about community. We've had a lot of that here. Um, the next one will probably be about DSC. Here's where we're going with DSC. Here's why we're going somewhere with DSC. What are we trying to do? What do we think is good right now? What do we think is not good right now, right? DSC, by the way, just a quick note, for example, on that. From our perspective, when you hit DSC's sweet spot, it's awesome. It can really simplify your life. If you get off that sweet spot at the moment, needing something like intermediate state or dependencies between or a composite, life gets a lot less nice. We know it. Keep filing stuff in user voice. Oh, in fact, since I'm on user voice, I'll hit this. Um, we were talking to somebody at, uh, actually, in this case, the North America Summit. How many people are really familiar with desired state configuration here? Just give me a raise of hands. I right, got half the room. All right. In desired state configuration, you just state, here's how you want the world to work, right? Kenneth equals rich, car equals Ferrari, color equals red, right? Money equals a lot. State how you want the world to work, okay? <laughs> and you can do this as in a resource basis, right? Okay, the file system should look like this, or the, you know, the services should look like this, and the process should look like this, whatever. And then within each one of those resource uh, 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 instances or, or, or definitions, you can actually define dependencies between them. Hey, I can't you know, get the file to this state. Or I can't stop the service until the following five things have happened. You with me? The other thing you got is, okay, but what? Right now we don't have a good way. What if there's an output from the action that I'm dependent on that I need for my action? Like, I'm creating something that needs an IP address, and I now need to use that IP address. Well, we hit that in the very first demo I did like a couple of years ago called data dependency, right? I have to be able to say, this thing depends on that one, and I need that piece of data from it, right? I hit that a couple years ago. There's workarounds, kind of. Um, and But we put out the product, we heard a little noise, and then nothing. And so team said, well, it's a problem in Kenneth's head, <laughs> which it might be, and that's fine. Or we thought, and actually other team members go, man, I'm kind of surprised because we thought that was a problem. Same thing with composite resources. Hmm, okay, we got composite resources out there, you know, but they're not quite what we would think would be best, but, you know, we'll see what lands. Um, what's, what was interesting on the data dependency, I'm drilling into this one specifically just so you get an understanding of what I'm talking about, is... Um, then I started hearing at the last summit, oh, well, we would do that, but we don't have data dependency. And I about killed them, politely, <laughs> for not having filed something on user voice <laughs> and had a few other people vote it up. And what I realized is he'd sort of realized it was there. He'd worked around it and kind of given up. Oh, that's too hard. They won't fix that problem. Does that make sense? Don't do that. Just, just don't do that. Work around it, please. Don't give up. Don't stop telling us. Do raise it on user voice and up the level, okay? I know I've said the user voice. It's just a different case than people think about. Oh, no. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, ancient move forward. I don't know why I went down that rat hole, but it's, that's what you get. DSC, oh, that's why. All right, so we are going to release a 5.1. WMF 5.1. Do get ready for it. It will release about the same time with GA Windows Server 2016. This list goes from the most predictable to kind of the least predictable-ish. And it's all reasonably near term. None of it's too far out there. So it's nothing's, nothing's overly crazy. Um, the, the issue that people should be aware of is that 5.1 is a replacement for 5.0. So we will be supporting 5.0. We'll QFE anything we need to between now and 5.1, etc. And then we'll need you to update to 5.1 
the, the, the fixes for 5.0 will all be in 5.1, and then 5.1 will be supported during the usual Windows server, you know, support 10 years, whatever the heck it is, right? The contract is. Yes, please. Yes, 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 yes. This should just be bugs and, and, and nits and nits and nails and stuff. So we should layer directly over 5.0, absolutely. And then with, in two or three months, we'll fade out the four months, I think it is. And we, we blogged about it, but I'd want to make sure people highlighted, understood it. Yes. Okay, so if I uh, push, for example, a DST configuration to a, 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 from a server with WMF 5.0 to a server with 5.1, it will work. Make sure I've got that right. You're asking remoting compatibility, not can I replace compatibility. You're saying, okay, I've got a 5.1 here and a 5.0 here. Yeah, that should work. I'm not sure you want to because in three or four months, you've got to replace them both anyway, probably, unless you want to live yeah, unsupported. It, it will happen at some phase. So. Oh, totally. And as you phase it out, yeah, totally. So that should be fine. I will make sure someone tests that. <laughs> Should I take a note? <laughs> All right. Uh, no, that's it. That's it. That's it. No, that's a great. It's a great point. Thank you. Yes. Uh, will you continue uh, operating system backward compatibility for these two operating systems? Back? Okay. Y yes and no. Let me clarify wh how we make this choice. Our rule of thumb, and that's the rule of thumb, is two operating systems back, server for sure, and then we try to get client, and then the client team has conniptions or not, right? It's kind of the way it goes. You have that discussion. We have the discussion with the client team. Um, the real motivation is that we f we're, when, we, when we first put out the WMF, we had a whole series of arguments to go down level or not. And we had to fight it all the way up and down the chain up to the presidents and you know everything, right? The CVPs and whatnot. Um, because it was kind of an anti-Microsoft thing of, hey, we only we push people forward with new technology, right? And our argument was, and it took us a long while to make this, believe me, our argument was, no, um, it's a management technology, and we need management technologies to go down level to where people are so their entire infrastructure can begin taking advantage of the new management technology. And if you do that, then it will enable them to actually move forward faster and more strongly and robustly. It's an enabler of forward movement by going down level ironically. You with me here? So that's the argument we made, and I'm not sure they still completely get that, but they all acquiesced, and now we do it. And they've gotten used to it. Oh, they're the WMF guys. Okay, well, they're going down level again. And so, and so that's kind of where we live. Um, so every time we release one, we think about it. And we ask, okay, where do people live? What are we currently supporting? You know, we don't do 2008, 2008 R2. You know what I'm saying? So it's just, a, it's just a question of where are people really living? How are they migrated yet? Is it a reasonable compromise for us, right? We don't do 2003, although we have a bunch of people there, but you know, it's time to move on. You know, so we're, we're kind of, we go through that argument. The answer is yes, within those bounds, in the bounds of the concept. Okay. You asked for Band-Aid, I gave you a cast, I know, but I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so, uh, OpenSSH, we expect OpenSSH to actually release and be useful in, the, um, in the, about that same time frame, right? Obviously, it won't release in it, it will release uh, in that same time frame. Uh, obviously, security and breach scenarios, everybody got the breach issue, I think, discussed earlier. Can you be top mind investment? Not much to say there. Um, this is actually kind of interesting. People have noticed we've begun to open source some of the documentation, right? It's gotten up there. It's gotten on GitHub, uh, thanks to Joey and others. This is going to continue, and we actually have a new uh, uh, documentation manager, a guy named Don. I made him actually come up at the last PowerShell summit in front of everybody and introduce himself so they could all blame him if he fails to get this. That's why I said we're going to bet Don's job. <laughs> that was the first he saw of it, but that's okay. Um, and so he's, 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 he's actually on a great track. He gets it. He's pushing it. He's uh, allocating the right resources. So we're looking forward to that. Please help. And then over time, we'll even think about you know, localization and stuff, right? How do we actually enable uh, localization help from people? Because you know, we, we don't get it all right. So we, absolutely, this is huge for us. So I think that this, that doesn't mean who said we needed to ship documentation on the box. That doesn't mean we're doing that yet. <laughs> but we'll, uh, we do care a lot more about docs. It'll help. Um, we will, now we're a little more speculative now. Right? All those were like, yay, verily, this will happen, right? 
Now we're hitting a little more of the speculation side. We will seriously consider, which means we're going to look at doing something with auto-generating UI on top of PowerShell. So give me a PowerShell module. I will snap you a UI for it. A little different than show command. will actually allow you to have multiple nouns, services, process, everything else. Do more like a, you know, a better job, more an Ibiza type frame than the, you know, the, uh, the, um, the MMC stuff. And you really want to deep dive into that, you can talk a little to David and sign some NDA form or something. But, um, but the, the intent again is so that, th let me tell you why we're thinking about this. We love PowerShell on the command line. There are people who see a blue screen and not one that kills their computer, but just a blue screen with a prompt and they faint, right? <laughs> They just look, they faint, they don't know what it is. It's like it's, this, it, it, they can't help it. And so, and we want people to faint less. And so, and so we're going to help them. But the way we're going to help them is going to help them by layering over PowerShell. Because the other thing that happens at the same time is people craft these GUIs and they just forget to put them over PowerShell because they're GUI guys and they haven't understood the value of the command line. And as much as a stick helps, it's a little better sometimes to use a bit of a carrot. It's like, hey, what if we bootstrap you with, oh, you run this command and you have all this UI, now you can just fix it, right? That would be nice, right? So we have the motivation to help people who need the help. And by the way, a lot of the help desk people, they're never gonna learn PowerShell, right? It's not in their job, to, it's not their career, right? They're there for a short while. They're just clicking until they get to the next best thing. And it's a reality of life, and that's fine. And it'd be great if you could just, instead of you guys having to craft a UI, because a lot of people do, if you could just give them one and let them move on. Now, other people have asserted in other discussions that that's not really what they want because then it trains people to be lazy and just use UI. It's true. We will probably have the way to automatically display PowerShell. We'll try to help train and smooth that out because that's the other thing that happens. People create UIs, and they don't necessarily display the PowerShell. So people aren't actually able to take the UI and learn how to automate from that. So those are like the three motivations. Unless I'm missing one. Am I missing one, David? Was I close? He's shaking his head no. I must have come close. Yeah, I came to his office a few a month ago or something and said, we, yeah, anyway. So he got a new problem. Um, so we will seriously consider, and again, we're considering, why not do this, right? Because it's time, effort, how do we, you know, we have to trade off, okay, how many more people do we benefit doing this? versus data dependency for DSE. Now, it's not quite the same resource. I'm just simply saying that there's all those trade-offs that we're making all the time. Um, so it's a serious thing to consider. That's why I can do it. Um, this is true, though. We will absolutely start having the community drive the future PowerShell. The RFC, this is user voice will be the input of uh, improvements. I've been through most of this. The RFC process will define the PowerShell experience. That's what I'm talking about. We're going to have more of that definition of the experience, design discussions occurring the GitHub RFC process. So look for that, we'll align that out as you go. Um, GitHub will definitely be the open source uh, repository. Uh, this is gonna uh, expand as a distribu can't talk. distribution service, right? As I say, for our items, possibly for others, we expect that to grow, keep contributing there. If you're doing anything and you're not publishing it there, please do. Do take the time to do the pester test and make sure you're passing the script analyzer. As we said, we just had the underhanded PowerShell thing going on to make that better and better and better. Our, the response we've gotten from customers consistently from day one in the gallery, and if you think this is wrong, you should tell me after, but the, the feedback we consistently got was, Make it trusted for us, please, right? There was a whole section of people, and we have these discussions, so it's important, your feedback's important. There's a whole series of people in the team or in Microsoft who are saying, no, the key is volume, and it's a legitimate argument. Look, if you have 10,000 resources up there, then people are gonna go there, more than if you have 1,000. If you have 1,000, more than 100, right? And that leads to just simply saying, I'll put any, piece of stuff up there that people want. Well, we found, particularly from the Microsoft PowerShell gallery, is that people are managing their, their lives off of this, right? <laughs> their services, their services, their data center. And, and some of them just take the code and copy down. And we already have a highly trusted, highly professional community who are expecting 
trusted resources, and I think are holding themselves, if you will, actually to a little higher bar. Consistently for the community, they, we would, they would rather have us put a little more constraints on, okay, don't ship something that has a bad, you know, commandlet name than, than otherwise. You all with me there? Make some sense? All right. That's all right. So, um, so this is the trusted gallery. And if there's things we should do to improve, where should you put those? <laughs> right? Tell us. All right, open source, open source communities. We're talking about that. We'll continue to contribute more. This is one of interest for me, um, which says we are looking for the right way to measure success. How do we know we're succeeding at making your jobs better and easier? If you have ideas there, definitely talk to us. <laughs> right? Because we're trying to figure that out a little bit. Right? We get the energy in the room. We talk to customers. We see the trend. We see the WF. So there's things we can do to know, but there's a lot I can't really know of. Hey, we used to be taking a long time. Now we're not. Right? How do we know you're getting value for your money? Um, and then... We are looking at doing a bunch of microservices. We started with the power with the micro with the editor service, right? People got that one in focus. Spent a little while on that. Okay, what other services do we need? How about a validation service? How do I know this code is actually good before it goes into deployment? How do I make sure it's easy? How do I make sure it all works? Right? Is there some microservices we could provide to make your job easier? We are in the bit of the brainstorm phase here. Feel free to actually mention those then too, right? Hey, it would be great if PowerShell helped me do this or found a team that helped me do this. Okay, it's okay to brainstorm a bit here. Configuration. We continually get requests for DSC, one of the key, uh, uh, we would say, um, barriers to adoption. I don't know if it's really a barrier to adoption or it's things that prevent people from using it as quick as they would. That's kind of a barrier, isn't it? Anyway, um, is the lack of a really strong DSC pull server, right? We have the one out there right now. It's a little more sample code. That's what its original intent was. <laughs> we sort of backed into it, right? It was first, oh, we should have a pull mode as well. You want that story? We should have a pull mode as well as a push mode, right? Okay, yeah, we're going to have a pull mode. Great, okay. How do you make sure we got it right? We'll write a great test. We'll use the test as like a sample. Are we going to do our own pull, pull server? Here's what it would look like. Okay, we have this code. Should we share it with people? You know, that kind of discussion, sort of where we ended up. Ended up. And so we have a useful DSE poll server, um, but it's a pain to set up, and it's not as robust. We've improved it a lot, particularly the reporting capabilities out of the LCM right now um, before, but there's a lot of work to do there. So configuration of service is definitely top of mind. How do we want to handle that at Microsoft and our team or others? How do we make sure we actually get that out there? Again, these are, these are uh, you know, forward-looking areas of interest. I, I can't talk really to code or actually release dates. Make sense? Um, the second thing that's definitely on the mind is PowerShell as um, the glue language for DevOps, uh, the DevOps tool chain. And this goes back to, there's this new paradigm, everybody's been familiar with it, I think, the past, again, days has gotten beaten into a little bit, right? You got the developers, got the operation, how do we have a common language? We really think that PowerShell should act as that glue language. PowerShell is a glue language. It's not a pristine, pure thing like C Sharp, right? C Sharp is this beautiful, pristine thing. PowerShell has a little slop in it on purpose, because it has to handle, like, the registry and .NET APIs, and you know this thing called extended type system? Anybody else familiar with that? Right? Anytime you say dot anything, that's actually where it goes through. Right? It actually, it actually doesn't go to .NET. We say it's .NET based, it's not, it's a lie. We actually go through the extended type system, through the type adapter system, and we have a type adapter for .NET, we have a type adapter for COM, we have a type adapter for XML, Right? We have a type adapter for CSV. Did I get that yet? Anyway, we have a type. No, we should have one. We have a type adapter for all these different things. And you can write your own, it turns out. Really? Yes. If you actually want to go in and implement a type adapter and have micro, you know, dollar $A dot your particular thingamabob, go with God. <laughs> There's an API. Where's Bruce? He'll probably write one for you. So it's a... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I need, knew I needed him in this session for some reason. Um, so, no, yeah. And if you hate the API, blame this guy who did the extended type system a long time ago. Um, so, if I can find him. If you can find him, that's right. Um, so, so that's, uh, anyway, my point there being that it's an adaptive system. 
It's built that way. It's thought of that way. It's got enough slop so you can always get your job done. In fact, in all cases, if you take a look at DSC, right? What do we do in DSC? This is a common philosophy we have. In fact, I did a presentation once a few years back on five design principles for PowerShell. One is where your best friend were not your mother, right? Which means, or you were not your parent, to be politically correct. Which means if you want to go bungee jumping, we'll tell you maybe you shouldn't, but we will drive you there, right? <laughs> If you're drunk and want to go bungee jumping, we might really talk to you a long time, but we still might drive you there, okay? So there's always a way to do something that you can't hurt yourself with in PowerShell. In DSC, we try to make a brain-dead simple system so people couldn't hurt themselves. The whole point of declarative programming, and we created the script resource. Now, why did we do such a thing? We did such a thing because if it's 2 a.m., and the world is falling apart around you, you really got to fix the problem. You don't need to do it perfect yet. That can wait for the morning when you're thinking clearly, right? <laughs> you got to stop the fire from burning so you can get the time to think about it and do it right. So we always have in PowerShell workarounds and hacks on purpose. Right? That's partly why we allowed you to call directly into .NET and directly into all these other languages because it said, look, we want to use commandlets. But when a commandlet doesn't work, you can still do it. So, Glue language, we're there. PowerShell history also provided. Free of charge. All right. Another uh, just overall direction. This hasn't changed. And you might not believe me on at least two of these, but we'll talk about it. Um, we, when we first did PowerShell version 1, there was no PowerShell on Windows. It was download only, which was not what we wanted. We did it for various reasons. Got us out of political problems, allowed us to ship, right? Okay, got that, Yahoo. But PowerShell version 2, I actually went around and wrote on whiteboards, PowerShell everywhere. It was the slogan. And by that, I meant everywhere on Windows, right? How do we make sure we do this? This still remains the common theme for us. We want PowerShell technology everywhere. We want it to be a universal language platform idea. That's why we use an AST. That's why we have all these capabilities. That's why we're pushing as much as we can to open source as fast as we can within business and resource constraints. Can you tell I've memorized that phrase? Right, with business resource constraints, we're pushing as fast as we can uh, to the open source because we want it to be useful, we want it to be usable. If you need it somewhere and it's not, tell us. Right, we'd like to know that. Hey, it would be great if PowerShell was, I don't know, in my mom's car. All right, <laughs> <laughs> except don't let her have the script resource thing, okay? Because that could really get you into trouble. Um, uh, velocity, you can tell, I hope, that we're actually starting to move the velocity a lot faster, right? We're starting with the WMF. That will continue. Now, as we do this, we have an issue, particularly as you start looking at the course CLR. It goes a lot of places. It allows this thing called side-by-side. -side. So if PowerShell is layered over cold CLR, does that mean I will get some way of PowerShell able to leverage that capability? Well, we're thinking about it really hard. <laughs> Because it turns out, so one of the things we're thinking about really hard is versioning and release velocity. Okay, WMF previews, is there a better way? Should we have two things? One that goes really, really quick, right, on a regular monthly basis, and maybe that rolls up into a WMF on a less frequent basis that everybody can get. Maybe there's something lighter and smaller. Maybe I can put it out more often. If I do that, do I allow side-by-side? -side? Do I not? If I do, how do I handle the versions? And how the hell do I get this thing updated? Does that make sense? If there was a perfect way to do versioning, I would love to hear about it. As it is, we've taken a look at them. We're, so we're seriously stepping back. In fact, this came up again just recently on the gallery. We had an open Q&A for 20, 30 minutes, which I'm fine, except I think I'm running out of time. Um, but a question came up about, OK, how are we going to handle versioning on the gallery? There were some problems they were having. And we just said, look, you're absolutely right. It's not, it, you are correct that it is not right now. <laughs> It is wrong now. It, 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 you know, it, it, it's not right now. And how, do, how are we going to fix it? We don't know yet. But we have it deeply in focus, and we actually have a few proposals internally that we're kind of running through. 
All right, and then maybe over time we actually get those out more in the RFC process again and get more common. But we're, we're, we're working through that now. It's a deep think on the versioning. It should go all across. So just be aware of that's happening. And if you have ideas or issues or, or, or wonderfully, back to my use of user voice, if you have examples where you're getting burned by the current versioning approaches, please, please, please file those and tell us. Do not be bashful about that stuff. Oh, I can't handle my job, blah, blah, because this versioning is preventing me from this. I can't upgrade because I have a versioning. If you're having any versioning conflict problems, tell us so we have the whole scenarios in focus. Does that make sense? So we have a whole set of use cases. I can take my new idea and run it past, oh, Stefan has this problem. Bob has this problem. Frank has that problem. Okay, we've solved them all. You with me? Or we haven't solved them all. At least we know we haven't solved them. We'll tell people, hey, we almost got versioning right. Okay, that was velocity. Simplicity, okay. You think, power first, PowerShell is not a simple language. C is a simple language. I love C, but I do. I grew up with it. I grew up with assembly too, but anyway, but, simply, but assembly is not simple. But C is a fairly simple language, except you can hurt yourself a lot with it. But I mean, you can, it's small, right? It's consistent, it's small, you know it. You can shoot yourself in the foot and a lot of other painful places but it's <laughs> but but you know it, it's simple in that sense Does that make sense that's what i mean by simple powershell is not that it's a very big language in fact i in fact i was just talking to jeffrey actually the other day we said i'm not sure that anyone has the complete range of powershell at the moment in mind <laughs> they're just the full scope of what you can do you know both deeply and broadly unlike version one where we had in our heads um, we got to look stuff up still so but what I mean by simplicity, I do mean things like desired state configuration, right? When done right, that gives you an order of magnitude improvement in simplicity. And I could go through what I call the PowerShell progression, but I don't think I have time. And that would be code. That would be kind of fun. Um, but what you see is as you go from no PowerShell to PowerShell, you shrink it. As you go to command, that shrinks again because it's known, right? But as you go use PowerShell in the real world, you have all these error cases, and you explode your life back again handling all the error cases. As you go to DSC, because it handles the layering with the resources, that code shrinks again to be really, really small because all the error handling is really taken care of in the DSC resources. You with me? And the experience should be simpler. Now, because it's simpler, people do more complex things with it. <laughs> and so it gets complex again. But <laughs> conceptually, it's heading in the direction of simple as I can get. Okay? All right. So that's kind of what we mean. And completeness. This is something, um, this is something uh, where it feels like, um, particularly over the past little while, we've put out a lot of stuff. We need to round the edges a little more, we need to do a little more polish on stuff we currently have. How do we make sure it's more complete? Make sense? All right. Are there questions? <laughs> Was that a lot of data? Would you like to know more about directions? Does that give you some? Hopefully, I, <laughs> I put it at kind of different levels, top, bottom. I don't mind answering any questions. Um, oh, there's one more thing worth noting. What do you do against overheating? Overheating of what? Me? <laughs> the team. Oh, the team. You know, that's a good question. Um, and this is where it goes back to the how do we smooth out the process, right? How do we get, because we live in these other environments, I would say that we're still spending too much time doing work that's not as effective as what we would like, right? So as we start to get the team a little more aligned around solving key customer problems, one thing I didn't talk about quite as much was the team shift. We'll try to shift the engineering team to actually solving more actual user scenarios end to end. And there, I think that actually helps them instead of, oh, I got this problem, this problem, this problem, sort of getting yanked away and a lot of context switching. You're able to solve a problem for a while and get the thing actually landed all the way down. As you start to do a little more test-driven development, which we're beginning to do a little more of, that will actually help a lot, I think, as well. A little fewer emergencies. And then as we start to move more stuff to open source, that will help those team members because we'll have to deal a little less with the internal processes. Does that make some sense? So I think we have, we have that... Uh, how do we get it? And frankly, as we get some of the user voice stuff, that will help us do some prioritization, right? So we actually make sure we're working on the right things that are most impactful for you. Um, other questions, and I got one thing that I will put in people's brain upcoming for community, which might be kind of fun. Yes. Management solutions like Chef, for example. 
That's not recorded, is it? <laughs> Look, we are, and, and first, we're just delighted with the Chef interaction. That's been wonderful. Um, yeah, as we tar started looking at configuration services, which I, I try to mention a little in the forward stuff, that's one of the things we'd definitely be looking at. How do we help make sure that you're able to get the right reporting? How to make sure you're able to, you know, to leverage stuff correctly and not have to necessarily you know, fall back to other things when you don't want to, when it's not a part of your environment. You should have a choice here. How, how do you scale DSC, is your point, right, without a management surface that you can actually operate against? I need to be able to say that my 1,000 servers are compliant. You know, well. For example, yes, absolutely. By the way, speaking of, all right, it's a total random. Yes, user voice, 1,000 servers. How do I manage them? Here's my problem, impact statement. That's all, that, by the way, is perfectly fair. That's not a bug, right? It's a clear feature request. In fact, it's not even really a feature request. It's a, what do you, it's a need statement, right? <laughs> we should have a new category, need statements. Yeah, put, put it in, please. Don't be bashful about that stuff. That's perfectly fine. And the answer is yes, we're looking at it and thinking about it pretty hard. Um, again, no, you know, no promises. Because we have this wonderful resource constraint you know, issue. Um, and as you start to use DSC, by the way, this is just a small rant that's my personal favorite. We, green, we talk a lot about DSC being a green field. Every demo I show is that whole cupcake demo, you know, put DSC on a server and then you have it manage the whole server. We need to adjust people's brains and understand that you can do DSC for just very small things in an existing environment, right? One of the examples somebody gave me the other day, I'll use it was, okay, this is totally random, but I can't help myself. Um, so you can always leave. Um, the door's over. Um, how many? Over? Okay. Um, so... Um, <laughs> Um, so I'm a program manager, it's my job. Uh, push the boundaries. Um, so <laughs> one of the things, um, one of the things, uh, a customer actually used DSC for this, cracking me up. In IT, you know, all IT organizations on the planet are perfect organizations filled with perfect people. We know this, right? And so what happens is, that <laughs> and so what happens is, Okay, so many of them have a tendency to have conflict, right? And some person owns this and some person owns that and they don't always quite gel and you're trying to work around it. One of these guys had a, a, a the application guys kept wanting to throw this, this service, this app on all of his boxes that ran a service which was running out of memory on his production stuff and they weren't using the app at all. It just turned out the guy's query for blasting the application to a set of servers was wrong, but he wasn't quite up to fixing it yet. It wasn't high enough as our priority list, so he was overly aggressive about the servers he was going to distribute his crap to. With me? And this guy's going, I'm going to kill him. So to avoid a, a conflict of physical nature, he wrote, a DS, he wrote a little DSC thing, which said, oh, if this service is there, make sure it stopped and then put it out on all the servers he cared about. <laughs> and so for the servers that he managed, which didn't need the app, the service might be there, but it never ran. Or it would run maybe for 30 minutes if they reinstalled it, and then it would shut down. And, right? and so, and I'm not trying to say one should do that <laughs> at all. But my point is, is that it's just a targeted use of desired state configuration and I think people have a tendency that they've got to manage the whole server with it. And that's not true. Look for targeted use cases and grow yourself into it instead of doing an all or nothing approach. All right, my last random point. Um, 2016, November 14th, will be 10 years with PowerShell. Um, we are planning, our expectation is, one of my guys now has a job, to do some small celebration. I don't know what we're going to do. But one of the things we're thinking about is doing, um, so get your head spinning a little bit, is a PowerShell around the world. So on November 14th, midnight, somewhere, <laughs> we'll start a PowerShell massive worldwide user group and set of demos, right? And we'll end it at the next midnight. And we'll just go around the entire world and each user group in each time zone We'll negotiate with the other groups in that time zone in some undefined mechanism. <laughs> and we'll spend their hour and demo on cool stuff. We're explaining cool stuff for that hour. Does that make sense? And it'll go to the next user group for the next hour. And so everybody should get a chance to sort of show their stuff for their time zone. 
And because there are time zones where there are probably no user groups, you might have a few extra slots to cover. <laughs> but I think it should be fun. So um, we're, we'll do something. Look for it. We'll blog about it. We'll tell people when it's coming. But it'll be fun. Anyway, we appreciate your support. It's been a great 10 years. We look forward to another 10 doing stuff even better. Thank you.